Hi, my name's Ed Hope. I'm a junior doctor in the UK and welcome to Sick Notes, my channel where we look at hospitals, human body, and I share some of my experiences of being a doctor. If that sounds good, you can subscribe and be part of our lovely community here on YouTube. Today, I'm gonna to be continuing my look at the fantastic show, Sales at Work. So this is episode four. Okay, so this episode is called Food Poisoning, which is where we eat some food that's been handled or stored or prepared badly, and it's got lots of bacteria that's able to grow in it, or maybe some parasites or even some viruses once they get into our body, our body detects them and kind of wants to flush the system out. So we get lots of vomiting and lots of diarrhea. We probably all had some kind of food poisoning at some point in our lives. I remember when I had a sort of raw sausage in Eastern Europe, I had a pretty nasty bout. So I'm looking forward to find out exactly what's happening to my body during this episode. <laughs> So here we see the stomach and it's represented kind of like a volcano with the lava being the acid which is a really nice analogy because the whole point of the acid in the stomach is to kick off the digestion process and also kill any of these nasties that might just be in food normally like some bacteria and viruses and other things like that. But obviously this acid could potentially damage our own cells in our body so the stomach has this specialized sort of layered lining that we call the gastric mucosa. Gastric is just a medical term for anything to do with the stomach. One of these layers produces a chemical called bicarbonate, which is an alkaline type chemical, therefore will neutralize the acid that comes close to the lining, therefore protecting the cells of the stomach, but still allowing the center point to be acidic to do its job. Knowing about the stomach mucosa is really important because it can be eroded away with certain infections and medications as well. And once that's eroded away, the acid will directly attack the cells in the stomach and will lead to a stomach ulcer, a particularly nasty condition. And the rock formation we see here in the volcano is not by a mistake because the stomach also has these ridges. So in biology, whenever we see these kind of ridge-like structure, it's for increasing the surface area. So in this example, it'd be increasing the surface area of absorption of the food. In the stomach as well, these ridges also enable the stomach to stretch. So when we've eaten a lot of food, the stomach can stretch up, and when the stomach isn't being used, it can shrivel down as well. <laughs> So this white blood cell has identified a new germ here. Germ is the layman's term for any disease-causing organism. So it can encompass a virus, a bacteria, a fungus, and parasite as well. The medical term we use is a pathogen. Path meaning disease and gen meaning something that generates it. So pathogen, something that causes a disease. And we've met a new white blood cell here as well. I'm not quite sure what this one is, but I guess we'll find out. I'm not quite sure what that bacteria spinning thing was supposed to represent, but our neutrophil has come to the rescue. So this other white blood cell wasn't as effective as getting this bacteria. So maybe that's a clue as to what they might be. Yeah. That makes sense. So this cell is an eosinophil, another white blood cell. And that's why it's not very good at dealing with bacteria because it's got a very specialized role. Its job is to deal with parasites and much larger pathogens than things like bacteria and viruses. They are also really important in clinical medicine because these are the cells that react inappropriately to certain things that give us an allergic reaction. <laughs> So as pointed out by the neutrophil, the eosinophil, is very, they're very closely related, so it kind of fits in the, the family tree we've been developing over these episodes. I'm kind of running out of room, but let me show you quickly. So here is our diagram from before. So we have our stem cell, our myeloid progenitor cell, some of the other cells we've met so far. So the red blood cell, the megakaryocyte that produces the platelets. We have our dendritic cell 
and we have our macrophage as well and here represents our neutrophil. As we said, the eosinophil is very closely related to all of these cells, but particularly the neutrophil. So here we have our eosinophil joining the family tree. Oh, so the eosinophils getting a little bit of bullying from the other cells. You know, obviously what we talked about, she's not designed to attack this type of pathogen. So I just wonder if that's some kind of foreshadowing in terms of what her motivation will be when she overreacts to an allergy. The fact that she feels like she's doing a bad job here. So when she sees something, she has an inappropriate like allergic reaction. I wonder if that's going to be something that plays out. Probably not. <laughs> What on earth is that? Enteritis vibrio? Never heard of it. Although I can kind of work out what it does purely because we're watching something on food poisoning, but also enter means anything in your gut. Itis means inflammation. Um, vibrio, no idea what that means, but this is where I can learn things from cells at work. So a bacteria that normally resides in seawater, so probably not something that caused my food poisoning uh, in Eastern Europe from that uh, sausage. <laughs> Consuming seawater contaminated by this bacteria can lead to contagious enteritis vibrio, food poisoning accompanied by severe stomach pain and the like. Well, kind of makes sense. <laughs> So we see these bacteria have these tails as well. We saw that in the first episode. These are the flagella. So these basic sensory organs and involved in motility as well. So how the bacteria can get around. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Generally, when we have an infection of the gut, the gut is in a way considered outside of the body we have lots of defensive mechanisms to stop anything getting into the bloodstream so as this t cell is saying here we wouldn't expect anything in the gut unless it's a real kind of severe thing to then sort of spread into the body <laughs> So we uh, did not expect to see a bacteria eat a neutrophil. So in reality, a neutrophil is about 10 times the size of a bacteria. So it's actually the neutrophil that's more likely to phagocytose, so eat the bacteria. Although maybe this one's particular big one because I don't know much about it. Although in previous episodes, we've obviously seen the bacteria do have lots of kind of defensive mechanisms. So maybe this is just demonstrating that in a different way. You don't see. So here we meet the basophil, which is another white blood cell to add to our family. Let me draw him in. So here is our basophil. Now the basophil is not something I learned a lot about in medical school, maybe that was just my training, but I know where it belongs in our family tree. It's very closely related to the neutrophil and the eosinophil that we saw before. And one other cell as well that we briefly saw in this episode, but I <laughs> chose to skip it, and that is the mast cell. Now these four cells make up the granulocytes. What does that mean? It means they have these granules in their cytoplasm. So these little pockets of chemicals. Now the job of these granulocytes is when they're activated, so when something around them triggers them off, generally by firing a receptor on the cell surface, their job is to degranulate and to expel these chemicals from the cell. So if these cubes represent our granules within the cell, when the cell gets the message, it will release these chemicals into the area. And in the case of basophils, this is something like histamine, and this works on the blood vessels. So this makes the blood vessels dilate and makes them more leaky, which means that more blood flows there and more cells leak out. Therefore, we get more immune cells to the area. So they're all to do with coordinating the immune response. Some of these chemicals that are also released in degranulation are toxic chemicals, things like enzymes that help break down the pathogens. That 
that's not a bacteria. What the hell? Obviously they put an ad break now. <laughs> Good teaser. <laughs> okay, it's a parasite. That was probably a bit obvious, wasn't it? Because it's an episode about uh, acidophil. It's an anisakis. I hope I'm saying that right. I've never heard of this type of parasite. I'm not really adding a lot to the pathogens in this episode. But this is a parasite found in marine animals, so it fits in with the seafood um the seafood source of the food poisoning before because we had our enteritis um, vibrio was also from uh, in infected seafood also accelerates the immune system when humans consume uh, anisakis infested seafood raw in rare cases they can invade the stomach and the lining of the intestines so we talked about earlier that normally uh, infections are localized within the gut and don't spread but in the case of this parasite it can spread um, causing food poisoning accompanied by severe stomach pain and vomiting. <laughs> so our body's having this vomit response because it wants to try and expel the pathogen from the stomach, get rid of the stomach contents. And I love this depiction of the basophil as this kind of mystic spiritual cell. It kind of goes along with my lack of understanding of it. It's a bit of a mystery to me what it does. I love how the basophil, when he's talking about being sick, refers to it as a sea of hellfire will open the forbidden door, <laughs> which is exactly what it feels like, isn't it? You get this real cloudy head and this sort of deep feeling inside and you kind of transcend onto another level. The medical term though for being sick, we call emesis. <laughs> So I preempted it, but here they uh, give a nice explanation of emesis here. And yes, there is an area of the brain called the vomit center. <laughs> <laughs> I always get goose pimples at this bit in cells at work where you're about to see the cell do its job. And that's, you know, the action in it is, is so good. But then when you think about this is actually happening in the body all the time, lots of different white blood cell types and, you know, combining with the natural defenses of the body to try and eradicate infection and keep you alive. It's a pretty cool thing. So uh, let's see what the acidophil has got in store for us. Very good. We talked earlier about the neutrophils being a lot bigger than the bacteria cells, so that's how they're able to engulf the bacteria and digest it, a term we call phagocytosis. So therefore, how are we able to deal with these kind of pathogens, like large parasites that are bigger than our cells? How is our eosinophil, you know, specialized in killing these parasites? Let me show you. So we've met some of these pathogens already, but let me just recap them. So we have a virus, which are incredibly small and not living things. They just have a sort of protein capsule with a little bit of a genetic material in them. Around about 100 times the size of a virus, we have a bacteria cell. Now these are living things, but they've got very basic area of genetic material that we call the nucleoid. And they have a cell wall and other things that we've seen before like pili and a flagella. Roughly two to three times bigger than bacteria cells, we have fungal cells. And these are the first example of eukaryotic cells. That means they have a true nucleus with genetic material and also more developed things called organelles which help run the cell. Now, this isn't quite to scale, but all of these things can easily be phagocytosed by one of our white blood cells. Now we'll get onto some slightly bigger organisms. One group we call the protozoa. 
So these are kind of single cellular organisms, roughly about 10 times the size of bacteria. Again, because they're eukaryotic, they've got a true nucleus and true organelles. Now these kind of vary in size. An example of one of these would be something like malaria. And then on the other sort of extreme end of size of parasites is a multi cellular organism so something like tapeworms and liver flukes and the anisakis so that's the parasite that we saw in cells at work and these look a lot much more like traditional animals that we are used to rather than these sort of small microorganisms so let's say this is kind of a liver fluke here it's got a mouth and an anus and a kind of sucker here so it can attach onto things now we can see the problem our white blood cells are no longer big enough to phagocytose these large pathogens. So what do we do about it? Well, this is where degranulation comes in, what we talked about earlier. So the eosinophil, this is our eosinophil here, will attach on to the side of the parasite, just like we saw in cells of work actually. And you know that pitchfork? Well, that represents the degranulation. So release all these toxic chemicals. So we have here these toxic chemicals that um, make up these pocket granules that we talked about earlier and they once they stick on they become activated and this releases these toxic chemicals onto the parasite and digests the parasite. <laughs> Hey, boom, and that's one dead parasite. So there we have it, another cracking episode of Cells at Work. We learn about emesis, eosinophils, parasites, granulocytes, and loads of other stuff all wrapped up into this lovely story. Thank you so much for joining me and being part of this series. I've been blown away by all the support. If, if you enjoyed it, leave a comment below. If there's anything I missed, again, let me know in a comment below. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys soon.